Welcome back to Beyond Four Walls, conversations on affordable housing. I'm David Dworkin, President and CEO of the National Housing Conference, the nation's oldest and broadest affordable housing coalition. I'm joined today by Mark Morial, President and CEO of the National Urban League, the nation's largest historic civil rights and urban advocacy organization. Although any introduction of Mark should probably begin with a proud son of New Orleans. With 90 affiliates serving 300 communities in 37 states in the District of Columbia, the National Urban League advocates for policies and services that close the equality gap through policy leadership, social programs, and research. At the community level, the Urban League and its affiliates provide direct services that improve the lives of more than 2 million people annually. Prior to joining the Urban League, Mark served as the highly successful and popular mayor of New Orleans, as well as president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, which is where we first met. He has been a leading voice on the national stage in the battle for jobs, education, housing, health, voting rights, equity, and entrepreneurship for his entire public career. He's also the author of The Gumbo Coalition, 10 Leadership Lessons That Help You Inspire, Unite, and Achieve. Thank you for joining us, Mark. I am so excited to talk with you today. David, thank you, and thank you for inviting me, and thank you for your leadership with the National Housing Conference, because it's truly been, I think, the most impactful, broad coalition of all of us who care about ensuring that every American is well-housed and is also in safe, decent, and affordable housing. So thank you for your leadership and great to be with you. And I've been looking forward to this conversation. Me too. So August 29th, I know that is a day you will never forget. And the weeks and months that followed, I often think of it as a conspiracy of incompetence and low expectations since the hurricane wasn't avoidable, but most of the destruction and loss of life absolutely was. 19 years later, how do you think about the lessons learned and unlearned from Katrina and how vulnerable are we to that kind of failure today? David, I had a chance to sit with someone who's doing a documentary 20 years later and the pain and the sting of the ineptitude and the incompetence of the response still is with me today because I know in my heart of hearts it could have been different. No one could have stopped the hurricane, but from ordering a late evacuation to the most immediate responses to the long-term confusion about rebuilding. It was not one of America's high points. It was not one of New Orleans' highest points, and it was not one of Louisiana's highest points. We were served by leadership which was inept and incompetent and didn't understand in a crisis, you got to work together and demonstrate a united front because it requires all resources. It was difficult. Uh, Many lives were lost, friends and extended family members. Homes were destroyed or severely damaged. My own home in New Orleans at the time took on significant damage. My mother's home took on significant damage. One sister completely lost her home. Another sister experienced the type of damage that forced her to relocate. Much of my family relocated to Baton Rouge for a number of years because they had no other choice because the city was so devastated by the hurricane. But the lessons, I don't know if we fully learn, although I will say that there have been changes in the response systems, but they haven't been fully tested yet. And until they're fully tested, we do not know if they will work. But a tremendous amount of money and effort was also put into creating a harder flood protection system with levees and gates. What I don't know is with the advent of the acceleration of more severe weather that's taken place in the last 10 years, if even those levees are tall enough, hard enough, secure enough to withstand the big one. So this is ongoing. And the steward of this has to be the mayor of New Orleans, the governor, the president, And they had a FEMA because New Orleans is just one of the Gulf Coastal cities. You're seeing devastation of flooding in Houston, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, coming all the way around the East Coast, going all the way up. 
These weather events, these hurricanes, these natural disasters can impact a substantial portion of the United States. Think about it, David. We've had hurricanes and severe storms on the West Coast, hurricanes and severe storms in Hawaii. I mean, this is a different situation. Lessons to be learned from New Orleans are preparation, response, communication, and collaboration. My heart will be seared with the memories of the photos of all of the New Orleanians on the roofs of their homes as the water rose being rescued by the Coast Guard with these helicopter rescues. That sight will forever be etched in my memory. Now, I had been gone from the mayor's office almost three and a half years at the point that Katrina hit. And I went through an interesting set of emotions. At the beginning, I said, thank you, Lord, that this is not on my watch and that I would have this responsibility, praying for the leaders that they would do the right thing, worrying about my family and friends. It quickly morphed after two days as me saying, I wish I was there. I wish I was in the driver's seat. I certainly would do the response and the response and the preparation far differently than that which I see. But that's yesterday. But I think people should know my love and caring for the city. So 29th of August is always going to be one of those days. Next year, I think because it's 20 years, there will be a lot of conversation about where the city is, what we've learned as a nation. And a look back, Colin Powell told me something profound, late, great Colin Powell, who I consider to be a mentor and a friend, told me when shortly after it happened, he said, you know, we don't know how devastating this is for the reputation of the United States globally, that the mighty United States of America could not protect its own citizens. He said, this is going to impact our reputation globally. And he said, I think I'm talking too much. <laughs> he didn't say anything else. But I think he was so profound and so right because of all the challenges we have as a nation, we've always had a reputation of being able to respond with competence, respond by throwing massive resources. And the truth is, after the stumbles of the first few days, FEMA and the administration put in, if you will, maximum force to both evacuate the city put pumps in to take the water out of the city and substantial resources to clean up some of the devastation in the city. But at the end of the day, David, it was not the leadership of the people, the grassroots energy, people in neighborhoods throughout not only the city, but the region who said this place is worth rescuing, saving, and rebuilding. And that rebuilding means that if you go to New Orleans now, visiting many neighborhoods. They've returned to some sense of normalcy. But the Lower Ninth Ward, St. Bernard Parish, some of the neighborhoods and areas in the region which were devastated were impacted by this mindset that some had that we shouldn't rebuild it. So let's let's talk about that because that, I think, was one of the most outrageous challenges that you confronted was the Urban Land Institute's plan to disinvest and depopulate the black neighborhoods of New Orleans. You know, there was a similar plan developed in Detroit during the bankruptcy in 2013. And one of my proudest achievements was killing it. How is it that 70 years after federal highway funding paved over hundreds of black and brown neighborhoods across the country, we're still fighting these battles? The Urban Land Institute plan, I remember when I got a call about the plan three or four days before it was going to be announced, a staffer from the Urban Land, Land Institute called me and said, well, we've been told that we should call you and give you a heads up. I said, tell me a little bit about the plan because I'm not familiar with the details. She went through it. I said, if you release that plan, I guarantee you I'm going to fly to New Orleans and I'm going to make a speech or call a press conference and I'm going to blast it. I said, you cannot plan in a corner to, if you will, destroy people's neighborhoods and then now 
evacuated to Atlanta. And you're saying, well, guess what? We're going to bulldoze your house. We're not going to give you any compensation. And why don't you just not come back? It was full headed. It was ethnic cleansing. And it violated the basic principle of a disaster. And that is shared suffering, shared response. I am part of a community. If my house survived, but my neighbor's house was destroyed, I've been impacted. And the leadership at the time didn't have the voice or the morality, the, the, the sensibility to communicate over and over and over again. We're in this together and we can't put a plan together that doesn't include it. So true to form, there was a pushback. I went to New Orleans and at St. Maria Goretti Church made an important speech in front of about a thousand people in a church where the lights were off, the electricity was out, and said that this plan was amoral. I was surprised that a reputable organization like the Urban Land Institute would be so tone deaf and it was based on false assumptions, right? Assumptions that New Orleans has got high ground and low ground. Well, New Orleans has low ground. Now, some's lower than others, but almost every part of the city lies below sea level. That's the reality of a beautiful American city. It was built on a swamp next to a river and next to a lake. But at the end of the day, one of the opportunities that may have been missed is when the city was rebuilding, was designing a program where people were given the resources and the money to rebuild their homes with more flood protection, elevated, more systems that could withstand. And that was missed. The primary rebuilding program, which was called Road Home, was ill-designed because it was designed based on market value of a home. Well, the truth, and you know this, market value may not give you enough money to replace a destroyed home. And I always thought it should have been based on a replacement value system where you look at what would it take to replace this home similar to the home that was there before. So that meant that because you had undervaluation in many Black neighborhoods, Many, many Black neighborhoods got, if you will, abused and screwed, to use a broad term. That's a technical but term. Yes, I get it. Technical term, screwed, right? And that is the truth. So we have to learn from that. We have to learn that the policy response left a lot to be desired, right? And because the offending party, the Army Corps of Engineers, as an arm of the Defense Department was immune from suit. In a normal situation, with all those levy breaks, the Army Corps would have been sued for negligence and had to pay all the damages that were incurred. But since they were immune through sovereign immunity, the government had to step in. And the government did appropriate a fair amount of money, the design of Road Home by the state, it was not, and it ended up being challenged in court under the fair housing laws and the civil rights laws. And the state ended up paying a settlement, but it was too late. The money was gone. The damage had been done. And that isn't true. So will we learn from that is really the question. And me, from where I sit, I've told people when it comes to the assessment of Katrina, I'm going to be compassionate and respectful, but I'm going to be blunt because it serves no purpose to push the mistakes under the rug and pretend as though they didn't happen. That's irresponsible. It always reminds me of a routine that John Oliver did on The Daily Show about 10 years ago, and he dressed up as a British colonialist, and he said, to call me racist would be to imply that I cared enough to hate them or was interested enough to learn things about them to dislike. And I think that is so often the problem. And I think that's a lot of what the work you've been doing 
at National Urban League and the legacy of the National Urban League is to say, no, no, you are going to get to know us and you're going to care about us because it's actually in your interest and you don't even know that. I think what you underscore here, David, is, you know, we're an interdependent nation Mm -hmm. and a set of interdependent communities. And while on the surface we may separate, we may divide, we may live in silos, we're interdependent from an economic, social, and cultural standpoint. And what we're building in this country, I like to think of as a first ever true multicultural, multi religious, multi gender, multi generational democracy. Yeah. And you don't have any history of this anywhere in humankind. And so America from the beginning, from the founding fathers, was an experiment in pluralism. And the founding fathers had great vision and made great error and mistake as well. So we have to think of ourselves as constitutional perfectors. We're perfecting, we're improving, we're building. It doesn't mean I can't look at a Madison or Jefferson or Washington and say, you were a slaveholder and I object to that. But at the same time, say your vision about a structure of government, your vision about the Bill of Rights had great currency and has value. We just have to make it work and ensure and guarantee it works for everyone in this, the 21st century. And I think that's where we are. We're trying to build in in the National Urban League for me and my work in New Orleans has always been about trying to level the playing field, work towards equity, but also to do it in a way that builds bridges among communities, right? Because the interdependence we have may not be obvious, but it is so real in America today, how we are interdependent as a nation. And we need leadership that recognizes that. And that leadership is not just political leadership. It's leadership in the non-governmental space. It's leadership in city halls, county halls, state legislatures, governor's mansions all across the nation. Yeah, it really is so unique in the world. I think we often lose sight of that. And the fact that, you know, if we're going to have a more perfect union, we are going to have to struggle for that. You've been at the helm of the Urban League now for over 20 years seems like yesterday you and Michelle were moving across the country to New York. Today, it's the National Urban League that's moving back to Harlem, where it was founded over a century ago. It's a big move from the heart of the financial district to Harlem. You're opening a new empowerment center. You're also opening a civil rights museum, creating affordable housing units, commercial spaces. That's a lot. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Because that's a big, hairy, audacious undertaking. So the animating force is that we must practice what we preach. And as an organization that preaches ownership, home ownership, business ownership, economic participation by Black people and all people in the American economy, it seemed to be inconsistent that when I joined the National Urban League that we were operating in rented space. And I learned from talking to many, the Vernon Jordans and the John Jacobs and many of the staff that had been with us, I said, we we used to occupy two buildings that we once owned in Manhattan on East 62nd and East 52nd. And at some point, a decision was made due to the condition of those buildings to move. And I said, well, now it's time to move in another direction. So the board of the National Urban League challenged me They said, well, why don't you think about how we do a bit of a moonshot, not just move to a new office. And uh, I began, you know, discussions with leaders in the city of New York's Economic Development Corporation. During the days of Mike Bloomberg, we assembled a informal advisory team, real estate consultants and lawyers to begin imagining what might be our options. Part of that imagination included relocating to Washington or Atlanta or Philadelphia or Chicago, who were quite interested in us relocating there. But also I said, 
let's look at real possibilities. And our real estate agent said, well, I said, what, what neighborhoods in New York would you be interested in? I said, how about Harlem? We need to be part of investing where people have redlined. We need to be part of a community that is aligned with our mission. How about Harlem? So we began to look and we found a great piece of land owned by the city and the state in central Harlem. And voila, we had a starting point for what has now become the Urban League Empowerment Center, 17 stories, mixed use, retail. Retail's already open. Some of the retail's open. Sephora's open and Trader Joe's open. Housing, which is almost completely occupied. Additional office space with people like UNCF and Studio Museum will occupy. And our offices and the conference center that we will own and control and the new Urban Civil Rights Museum in Harlem. So this was, David, a moonshot a double bottom line project where once we invest in it and build it, it will begin over time to generate revenue for us, but also sending a powerful message that we are investing in communities. It's one thing to put out positions. It's another thing to have fact-finding missions and seminars and workshops. It's another thing to do it. And this is what we've done. We are practicing what we preach in a building. We've got three very powerful developer partners, including an African-American firm named BRP. Our real estate consultancy team is led by an African-American firm called The Bar, along with our longtime outside counsel, Charles Hamilton. We've got an African-American architectural firm, the Schweitzer Group. And then we've got an incredible retail partner known as Taconic and affordable housing partners, BRP and LM. This was teamwork. We had support to help us on structuring from Goldman and Margaret Otadu. I want people to know that this was a team approach and we had Black professionals, white professionals, Black developers, white developers. I mean, we had a team of experts to help us do this. And I'm greatly indebted to them because in any big project, we had some bumps. And we had some turbulence along the way, trying to pull the pieces together. My chief development officer, Dennis Soretti, has been remarkable in helping us almost complete what will be almost a $100 million capital campaign. We're not complete yet, but we're getting there. And the city, the state, Charles Schumer, has helped us get some directed funding. He's been a champion for us. Kirsten Gillibrand as well. It's just Adrian Todman has helped us expedite a number of things through HUD, which is where our directed funding comes from. That's your senators and the acting HUD secretary. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And they have been really worked with us to pull off. So hopefully sometime mid next year, we'll have a great big ribbon cutting to celebrate the final completion of this. We're getting there. I love it. uh, Thank you for asking. And for it's going to be, I think, a example of urban development 21st century style. Well, and if you're not going to be a part of the Harlem Renaissance, who is? Yes. And a hundred years after the Harlem Renaissance, there's a new Harlem Renaissance. And I want to say this housing, because as leader of the National Housing Conference, we've got 177 units, all affordable. And so that's a remarkable feat as well. But it was important for us to say to people who say, well, I'm not so sure. I want to do affordable. I'm not so sure we can do it. I'm saying, look at what we did. Now, we had help. I mean, we had support. The public authorities, look, I got I to gotta also say Andrew Cuomo, Mayor Bloomberg, Mayor de Blasio, and Mayor Adams, three New York mayors, Governor Hochul, the current governor of New York. I mean, they have all been unflinching in their support and in providing financial support for us to build this building, as well as a long list of 30 to 40 private corporations and foundations and individuals who've been supportive. And we're going to give them a lot of shine when we cut the ribbon. So everyone will know this took a Herculean effort on all fronts. And of course it would. A veritable gumbo coalition, as you might say. And, you know, I often talk about NHC as the unlikely coalition because we work with such an unusually broad group of organizations. What advice would you give me on managing a diverse coalition? 
You know, I think it's so important when you manage a coalition to give everybody a chance to be heard. But to be heard does not necessarily mean that everybody's point of view can be heeded. This is the challenge, right? For everyone to understand, we're going to try to synthesize all thoughts and all points of view, but we're not a discussion group. We are an action group. And I think that that is what is so important. And I think hearing people, giving people a seat at the table, a meaningful seat at the table in the discussions is so critical and so important because at the end of the day at the National Housing Conference, I mean, you put together a brilliant plan. We couldn't get it enacted at the beginning of the Biden years, but we're going to take another shot, right? We're not done. We're not giving in. And I think the consensus is building on something that you've been saying and we've been saying for a number of years. We have a crisis in this country of housing supply, of housing affordability, of housing access. It is a deep crisis. It is a difficult crisis. It's not acceptable for there to be all these unhoused people on the streets of Los Angeles or New York or New Orleans. It is not acceptable. People should be morally outraged and say, well, what are we going to do about it? Well, you're not going to arrest your way out of it. You know, you're not going to spend more. You just have the moral like issue. Lighting, ten, you're going to pay more money to do that than to do the right thing. Yes. Ridiculous. And I think we've also got an opportunity in the 21st century to think differently about how we design house. We have smaller families or sometimes you have the willingness of people to live together. So we have to imagine what building 21st century housing means. It may not be the three bedrooms, and a garage model as much. It may be something very different, right? Many people do not want a lot of space, right? Some may want a lot of space. Many people want no responsibility for maintenance, like cutting grass or taking care of the exterior. We have to build and accommodate those that say, yeah, but I still want to own. I still want to build value and I want to build an asset that I can call. So that, to me, is why this is an opportunity for change. It is. So speaking of change, one of the lessons in Gumbo Coalition, and I'll put in a plug here if you won't. You can buy it on Amazon. It's a great book, if I can it say. It is so, a great but book. It, but it's a real book, yeah. It's, it is. And one of the lessons you talk about is finding the innovation advantage. And you know, the technological innovation is replacing old products at an exponential rate. There's a lot of fear about AI, especially among civil rights advocates, but it can also be a powerful tool in identifying and combating disparate impact. How should we be thinking about harnessing new technologies to serve our priorities? So AI and the technological advance, has the opportunity to be extremely strong. That opportunity to be extremely strong and to be beneficial. But it must be done with guardrails and standards. And you might call it rules and regulations, but guardrails and standards. And, and let me tell you why. Every technological advance in this country has involved setting up guardrails. Let's go to the automobile as one of the great innovations of the 20th century. When automobiles were first built, there were no stop signs, no traffic signals, no speed limits, no crash worthiness tests, no fuel emission standards, no real bumpers. And as things evolved, we built a set of standards and controls to ensure that the American people would be safe with the automobile revolution. The very same with household items, be it a refrigerator or a modern stove. It went along with safety standards and conditions. Well, I'm concerned that we are allowing the technological revolution to take place with self-rule and self-regulation. And part of it has to do with a broken, divided political system that can't find consensus. And businesses who, in one case, say, hmm, we want to 
operate without rules. But in another case, we want to be protected from responsibility and liability. You can't have it both ways. And so I think that we have to plan and prepare. AI is, like some of AI, I like. I like clear at the airport because it allows me to move more quickly. However, I don't like going to the airport and not have one single person to talk to and have to do everything by using a touchpad or keyboard. So there's a component of AI, which is going to cost people work and cost people jobs. What we need to understand is that AI is also going to create some jobs. A modern automobile eliminated the blacksmith industry who would take care of horses. The modern automobile probably put a dent in the business that sold the food that horses eat or veterinarians that took care of horses because all of a sudden there was a need for less horses because there were no buggies and no carriages. Okay. But it created contractors that built roads, technicians that built street signs, traffic signals. It created a new... We also have to get our arms around what are the new jobs and make sure that our preparation system, K-12, through community college, college and beyond, our workforce system is designed and set up to prepare people for tomorrow's jobs so that people are not left standing. This is a difficult societal issue, and it's worthy of debate. And certainly as a civil rights leader, I'm concerned about the revolution occurring with built-in biases because the people designing it bring their own sensibilities. This is why facial recognition has been so controversial because it, it may not work on darker skins. That's what the studies show. Well, I am confident that if they work on that, they can fix that. But you got to want to fix it. They have to want to fix it. That's exactly right. That's it. That's the bottom line is, do we want to fix it? Or do we want to get it right? I think that's essential. So it's a good segue to talk about the legacy you've inherited and the legacy you pass on. Your family has a long history fighting for civil rights in this country. Your father, Dutch Morial, an icon of the modern civil rights movement. He benefited from his parents' experience. How is your family's legacy influenced by your own journey? And what are the lessons you hope to pass on to your kids and future generations, both in your family and more broadly? I hope to pass on that it has to be lifelong work to fight for justice and equality. And no matter where you are, in the private sector, in the public sector, in the governmental sector, whether you have an opportunity like me to work on this as a full-time advocation, we must be committed to work for fairness, a level playing field, an equitable future, and a tolerance for people who may not share our religious views, our race, or our predisposition. We also have to fight against hatred, religious hatred, racial hatred, gender identity hatred. We have to fight. And so my thing is, you've got to make that a value proposition. It's not a finite thing that the civil rights movement kind of accomplishes some goals and then that's the end of it. It's imbuing values into how we live the same way the values of democracy, right? The values of citizen participation, the value of freedom of speech, the value of privacy is enshrined in not only the American Constitution, but how we think about ourselves as Americans. So we've got to train, teach. My parents were passionate civic leaders involved in civil rights, involved in politics, involved in race relations, involved in education. Uh, they lived it. They breathed it. They worked it every single day. Whether my, the next generation, I hope, will recognize that some will be called to do that work. And you could do it while you're in a corporate gig. You could do it while you're in a government gig. It's got to be part of your value proposition. We also have to recognize that progress can be lost if we're not eternally vigilant. If there's any lesson in America when it comes to race, relations, and civil rights, it's that you can make three steps and go back two. You can make two and go back three. 
that this fight and this battle is an ongoing battle. It's work. And when I say ongoing and a battle, I mean in a respectful, nonviolent, educated mm-hmm. way. I don't mean in a, in a physical way. I mean it in another way. And so we have to recognize that. I'm indebted to my father and mother and their generation for leading by example. And that's probably the most important way to lead, by example. They set standards, they live by those standards, and they didn't expect you to do what they were not doing. So you followed them as a model. And for me and my brothers and sisters, and my mother was an educator and my father, certainly in public life, the people they touched, they were always teaching, always coaching, always mentoring. Yeah, I mean, our our kids don't always hear what we say, but they always see what we do. Boy, that is profound. They see what you do, and I think it's so profound. And and we all have to be cognizant of that. Yeah. When we are around our children. Look, I'm blessed to have three children. Everyone has children, even if they're not their biological children. You have nieces and nephews and mentees, and we all have to be cognizant of the next generation. All of the people, whether they were coaches or teachers or or other leaders who watched me, touched me, pushed me, said, hey, what are you doing? Keep on. It had a profound impact on me. It meant a lot just to get a word of encouragement from an older person. It had a profound impact. Yeah, it's so powerful. So we're so much more than what we do. I always ask this question. What's the most important and interesting fact about you that has nothing to do with your work? (laughs) I love music. Oh, really? I love sports. I love food. I love people, right? You just described the true son of New Orleans right there, haven't you? I love fitness. I'm a workout person. I'm a frustrated, I say a frustrated jock. You know, I grew up thinking when I was a kid, like a lot of kids, one day I'm going to be in the NFL. One day I'm going to be in the NBA. One day, one day, you know, you're dreaming and Dreaming and daydreaming and playing uh, at that level, little league levels and high school levels was really a passion of mine. So I love sports to this day. You know, my alter ego is to be a sports commentator, play-by-play announcer or a color person on on sports. And so, you know, that's that's probably the side of me that, you know, may not be something my, my, my friends and family know. But I think that when you're in the public eye, people will get a chance to know you on that level. But I look, I appreciate the work. We got a lot ahead of us in housing, right? We sure do. And it's been inspiring to me that this election has become so much about housing, and it should be. National Urban League has been a founding member and really part of the heart and soul of the Black Home Ownership Collaborative. Appreciate you. Appreciate Cy Richardson from your team, who's provided so much just hard work and, and inspiration, and we're going to do that. Psy has been an incredible subject matter expert for us. I remember when the recession of 07 and 08, we saw signs of it, and I said, Psy, well, how, how, do we really res- from our, how do we respond to this? He said, we have to build housing counseling, foreclosure counseling. This is the best method. And I remember we went and we pushed and in that early bill, HERA, I think it was called, there was more money for housing counseling and foreclosure counseling. But it was Cy who kind of said, I said, Cy, I need one thing. I need something we do that can expand. And so that led to this dynamism in the urban league movement now where we're serving forty to 50,000 people a year with housing and foreclosure counseling. We're transitioning probably two to 3,000 a year to become home buyers. We've sort of centralized our role in the ecosystem. And I say, people ask me, what do we need if we're going to rebuild home ownership? We need a supply side initiative and we need a demand and a demand preparation initiative. You're going to help people learn, understand the best and the worst of buying a home so they don't get used and they don't get into a bad deal. And we can do that through home buyer education, through housing counseling. That's right. And, you know, those of us who are multi-generational homebuyers, we get that. And it's part of the privilege we grew up with having parents who were part of the middle class and who were homebuyers. But if you are not inherited that legacy, you don't have that. And I think that's where 
organizations like the National Urban League and others can really make a difference is that we provide people who didn't have that with the resource, the advice, and also the encouragement to be a homeowner and build wealth in a way that very few other mechanisms give us that opportunity. And you guys have more than just our great advocates. You have mud on your boots. You really do it as well as talk about it. And I think that's one of the reasons why you're so good at talking about it. And I really appreciate you talking about it with us and everything I've learned from you as well. Appreciate you, David. Appreciate your leadership and uh, your determination and patience to be a coalition building. Coalition building requires energy, but it also requires some patience. Yeah. Well, maybe a little less patience and a little more energy, And but I appreciate your saying that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this edition of Beyond Four Walls. You can visit the National Housing Conference at nhc.org. There you can learn more about affordable housing policies, affordability challenges throughout the nation on our Paycheck to Paycheck database, and explore membership in NHC for you or your organization. We appreciate your interest and look forward to working with you in the future. Until next time, I'm David Dworkin, NHC's President and CEO, wishing you a great day.